Excellent. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to week 13 of um, the OLS 6 program. Uh, so today we have a special call. We are talking, first of all, about um, self-care and mental health. And then we have some time for quiet reflection, followed by um, a little bit of socialization as a bit of a gentler call today than many of our full force trying to pack in 17 speakers into an hour and a half. <laughs> I'm only exaggerating a little bit here. Um, so at the start of every call, we go through a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off into the main call. Uh, so I'm going to do that now. Um, for those of you who've just arrived, I'm posting our Etherpad notes into the chat one more time. I refer to different lines in the Etherpad as we're going along. Um, if you're watching on the recording, you won't be able to see that Etherpad, um, but hopefully you'll be able to fo follow along mostly anyway. Um, so the first thing that we like to remind everyone uh, is that we have a code of conduct in open life science. So this usually means that uh, if you are participating in an open life science space, such as this one, or are you, if you are representing open life science in some way, then we ask that you behave in a way that treats other people with respect in the way that you would like to be treated in their stead. Um, this is sometimes harder than we may expect, whether it be due to cultural differences, misunderstandings, anything else. Um, so if at any point you believe that you have either experienced or witnessed behavior that isn't in line with the guidelines that we have set out, uh, this can be uh, reported and we will try to handle it. Um, so the code of conduct itself is right now in the etherpad on line 31. You can see a link to openlifesciorg slash code dash of dash conduct. Uh, you probably don't want to type that in yourself, hence why if you can reference the etherpad that's easier, or you can also find it linked to from the Open Life Science website. Um, in order to report things, if you need to do so, uh, the easiest way to do that is email team at openlifesci.org. That reaches the four OLS directors, um, as well as Paz Bernardo, who is um, our staff member. Mm -hmm. However, if at any point you would rather reach an individual rather than a group, especially if, for example, you need to make a report regarding one of the people receiving that team email, then you can report by emailing any of us individually. That's Berenice, Malvika, Emmy, Yo, or Paz at openlifesci.org. And the details for reporting there are on line 33 of the Etherpad as we see it right now. So um, also, if you're participating in Zoom, on the top left of my screen, um, I'm on a laptop, I can see where it says live Otter AI. Um, and if you click on that, you can actually click on view stream on Otter AI. That allows you to see the transcription of what's happening in the call. So whoever is speaking, um, assuming they're speaking in English, it automatically transcribes the words that people are saying. This helps uh, participation for anyone who may have lost focus for people who are hard of hearing or for people whose language uh, may be other than English. Um, and we probably won't have breakout rooms in this call. Um, if we did, I would remind you that we don't have Otter in breakout rooms. That's not available. It's only available in the main room, um, but that probably won't be a concern for today. Um, I think that's the majority of my intro housekeeping. Uh, so the first thing that we're having today is uh, Wendy has kindly joined us from Dragonfly Mental Health in the middle of the night at 5 a.m. to offer a talk about self-care uh, and mental health. Uh, Wendy, you probably want to introduce yourself better than I would, so I'll hand over to you. Sure, thank you so much. Um, let me get my PowerPoint set up just as a useful tool to share. And um, does it look like you can see my screen? It Great. looks perfect. All right. Well then, yeah, so it's a joy to be here. Um, I, we always start by letting you all know that Dragonfly Mental Health is not a healthcare provider organization. Um, we are a by academics for academics nonprofit dedicated to cultivating excellent mental health among academics worldwide. Um, and so we're providing peer advice, information um, that is evidence-based, but it, the information we provide does not qualify as medical advice and does not substitute for speaking to medical professionals. So just to be clear about all of that. 
Um, so a quick intro to myself. I am a PhD uh, in molecular and cell biology. I went to UC Berkeley and I then studied psychiatric epidemiology at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and I was studying biochemistry before that even as an undergraduate. And so altogether I have about 19 years of brain and behavior research all the way from molecules in my biochemistry lab to populations uh, as an epidemiologist. Um, however, throughout my career, I ended my research career, um, I ended up getting involved in a lot of organizations that focused on self-care and mental health and getting the community together within my academic spaces, um, first at UC Berkeley and then at Johns Hopkins to create led peer-led organizations to really help us get together and break stigma and talk to each other about uh, mental health, mental illness, when to get help, and, and provide support for one another. Um, so that's how I got into the world that I am in now, which is leading this uh, worldwide organization. It's, we've only been around um, a couple years now. We were founded in April 2020. Um, so our, our third birthday will be next uh, April. Um, but we're keeping with that same thing that we think is really important. It's by academics for academics. Um, and we have over 300 volunteers from more than 45 countries. We do research, community building, um, as well as provide informational um, talks and workshops and anti-stigma campaigns. So um, I'm glad to take just uh, maybe 10 minutes today uh, to discuss um, self well-being and um, self-care and mental health with you all today. And then I'll pose a self-reflection um, exercise. So in other um, spaces, we have elite athletes, for example, um, like Serena Williams. And, uh, you know, they, they train their bodies um, to the highest uh, level intensity in order to perform at their absolute best. Um, but, you know, when they experience injury, physical injury, um, they're not worried about getting the care that they need. Uh, they, they'll get it even courtside. The top players um, will receive care and attention courtside at the slightest hint of injury in order to preserve their most important um, you know, tool of their trade, their, their bodies. And in fact, we really see um, that if you dig deeper into an elite athlete's training repertoire, there is a lot of rest. There is a lot of recovery time built into the practice, to the utilization um, of their bodies. And so in academia, we really are at the, the peak for elite training of the mind. And um, unfortunately, we really don't take good care of our most important instrument, the mind. Um, so that's what we really focus on here at Dragonfly Mental Health and want to hopefully get um, more people talking about it, more people focused on it and prioritizing your taking care of your mind. Um, and what we've really found over the years of working with academics is that there's something very specific that tends to stop us from taking care of our minds, and that's stigma. This is a word cloud that came from a survey we did at Johns Hopkins uh, among graduate students, faculty, and postdocs there. And the biggest word that people you know, gave us over and over and over was um, fear of, of, of professional repercussions and, and stigma from their peers, essentially. Um, sometimes stigma from their families, but um, it's, it's the biggest thing that we face, honestly. And it's really unfortunate because our minds are just so important to everything that we do in work and out, but we, we don't take the time to take care of ourselves. Um, and we'd like, to, we'd like to change that. Um, and see that change at, at Dragonfly and at Open Life Science. So uh, I'll just introduce the concept of mental health as a spectrum. Um, you know, mental, mental health itself is actually uh, the part of the spectrum that we all really aim and want to be in. A mentally healthy state is something that 
um, you know, we're aiming for, we want to be in that state, we perform our best, we feel our best when we are mentally healthy. Um, along this spectrum, uh, it, an inevitability of life is that there's going to be some stress. We're going to be exposed to stress that is planned or unplanned, um, predictable or unpredictable. Uh, these stresses come up in everyday uh, life and uh, periodically, um, but moving from a stressed state, acutely stressed state back to a mentally healthy state is a bounce that we are normally able to move through very, very simply, um, pretty easily and without a lot of, uh, a lot of help. Um, a distress state on this mental health spectrum really is a state that's beyond stress. It's something that doesn't reach criteria for a mental illness or a mental disease in any way yet, um, but it is a, a state that is beyond a normal stress that you can bounce back from. It may um, be lasting longer than normal stress. Uh, you may struggle to get back to that mentally healthy state without additional time or effort or um, you know, maybe even psychological intervention uh, with a professional. Um, but then further along on the spectrum is a disease state where um, now we've got a point where for various reasons, potentially and probably, um, someone has now reached a level of dysfunction and uh, disability uh, with their mind that involves their mind that prevents them that really usually not always but usually requires or would benefit from um, medical or psychological intervention and requires a lot more effort to get back to that mentally healthy state and I do want to point out that people who have struggled or have um, developed a mental disease can live with a chronic condition, um, but if they're receiving the right care, the right medicine, uh, maybe, or the right kind of psychotherapy that for them, um, they can be living with a disease, but uh, with also with mental health. And then the furthest space on this, this spectrum of mental health is crisis. And so that is a state where someone really has reached a point um, where they require intervention immediately. Um, and they often, very, very often cannot um, or will not be able to get that care, um, get access to care that they need in that moment. Um, so that is a state, unfortunately, we in academia and, and in research um, and science tend to allow ourselves to get to before we seek or ask or start looking for care. Um, and what we at, at Dragonfly Mental Health um, want to emphasize and encourage our peers to do is consider this entire spectrum. All of us are somewhere on this spectrum um, and we'll bounce around from place, from, uh, you know, kind of point to point along it from day to day um, as well. But we, we really encourage that self-care is an important piece of dealing with all aspects of this and trying to keep ourselves closer to this uh, mentally health, healthy state um, and prevent the, the um, getting, getting worse and worse and reaching more severe versions along this spectrum. So I want to make sure that everybody leaves today knowing that mental diseases are real biologically and environmentally driven illnesses. They can be episodic, they can be chronic, or they can be singular events. And almost all of them are preventable or, and or highly treatable. And what we know from the literature, what we know from everything is that critical to a mentally healthy climate and culture is access to care and community support. And so psychiatric illness can be come from um, multiple places, the brain, the body, and the environment. Um, and we obviously only have control over certain things, um, but you know, our her the heritability of things, of mental diseases, the genetics is something that you're born with. 
Um, but it's something that you can prepare for if you know that something like depression or anxiety runs in your family. Um, body, how we sleep, how we exercise, what we eat, um, and how our endocrine system is working is, are all things that um, might be a little bit more under our control and really benefit from self-care and interventions like that. And then the environments that we put ourselves in, um, you know, create stress, sometimes have structural issues uh, that allow for harassment or um, encourage isolation. And those are things that, um, you know, maybe if we identify that's where a lot of our, um, our, our issues are um, coming from, we can, we can work on those in different ways as well. And so we can, we can modify these issues um, with the brain through medication, through therapy, um, through you know, more extreme uh, and, and larger interventions like um, ECT, uh, the body you can engage in really heavily with thoughts and behavior change and treat underlying endocrine disorders if necessary. And then in the environment, you can work on these um, things on yourself or your, your institute um, or your department might be able to help with culture change, prevention and stress reduction. So I'll just highlight that in academia, um, we've, we have a lot of evidence that those who are graduate students have much higher rates of depression and anxiety. Those with higher IQ and education report higher rates of mood disorder. Um, and we've seen in studies that uh, medical students and residents, for example, have much higher rates of burnout and depression um, than folks in other career paths. So this is a big issue for us, but what can we actually do? What is the evidence-based approaches to self-care? Um, what we've found in the literature and, and our uh, organization recommends as peers um, is to really try to do as much of this prevention as you can. Integrate into your daily um, and weekly and yearly you know, mentality that it's okay to take a mental health day, um, to build and, and maintain an exercise routine. We know that it's really important to get out to na in nature when you can. So that may be a little more difficult when it's winter and it's getting cold out, but um, getting out during the day and in nature um, whenever you're able is really uh, a powerful mechanism to, to self-care and take care of yourself. Um, massage and acupuncture, meditation, um, eating well, these are all really great forms of self-care that are evidence-based to improve people's mental well-being. Um, depression, it turns out, we now know, really responds quite well to light therapy, especially if you experience issues around seasonality. So if you're really um, feeling worse during the uh, winter months um, when there's less light in the Northern Hemisphere, um, then that those are things that are um, light therapy really has been shown to improve that tremendously. And one of the things that I did, for example, in graduate school was pick up a new activity or skill. I learned to play mandolin and I knew a lot of other graduate students at the time who did things like sports or um, art or rock climbing. Uh, some of my friends crocheted, someone took up welding. Many people adopted pets. These were all really important, wonderful things for people um, and keeps you grounded and helps maintain mental health. So um, one of the other points to make, though, is that if you do find that you're starting to struggle, um, it's really advisable not to take part in uh, mind altering substances, specifically alcohol, um, because alcohol is a depressant. It is going to, it's something that while it may give you a little bit of reprieve in the moment, if you're already starting to struggle, um, it has a very serious risk of making things worse. So, um, you know, if you don't know if you need help though, call in the experts. Um, they're gonna be able to help you determine what kind of care you might need above and beyond self-care. 
Um, and so for me, graduates as, during graduate school, psychotherapy was a really big, important piece uh, of my self care. And I started weekly sessions. Um, and honestly, the sooner you start uh, something like that, if you are struggling, usually means fewer visits. So um, I personally recommend if it's a possibility to try to set up two to three intro sessions with therapists and pick a therapist that works for you. It's a really important piece, especially for those with higher educational attainment, that we have a very good therapeutic alliance with any therapist that we see. Um, and if medication is of interest, you can talk to a general practitioner or you can seek out a psychiatrist to get that kind of care as well. And so if you're not sure, um, still, uh, you can always visit us at Dragonfly, um, uh, at our YouTube channel, Dragonfly Mental Health. We have a series called Dragonfly Asks the Experts, and we have a video that's linked here, um, <clears throat> uh, or just search us on YouTube, and Dragonfly Asks, and you'll find the video where we talk to an expert psychiatrist about when is the right time to seek care. So- Welcome. With that, I just want to end by emphasizing that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, and we really need to move towards mentally healthy um, states and practices so that we can really take care of ourselves. Uh, so for the reflection exercise, um, I would suggest a recovery list. So take 10 minutes and write down um, a list of things, as many things as you can possibly think of, that are ways in which you um, feel like you can rejuvenate yourself. So for me, it might be running, dancing to some music, taking time and baking some brownies or taking my dog for a walk. And then with that list, once you've written down all the things you can possibly think of um, that help make you feel a little bit better, pick you up, or a nice break, um, write down and reflect uh, the feeling you have after you've done these things. So you can think of a specific time, the most recent time that you went for a run or, or danced to some music, and how did that make you feel? What was the response to having done that? And so after a run, I might feel tired, but I feel good. Dancing around by myself um, makes me laugh and smile. Uh, when I bake brownies, I usually bring them into the lab and share them with my lab mates. And that really feels good to share with people. Um, and walking the dog, I, I really just enjoy watching her explore the environment and marvel at what it must be like <laughs> as an animal. Um, so I, I would uh, propose that as a reflection exercise. And then at the end of it, you'll have a long list you can go back to and a reminder of things that you can do um, and, and how it's gonna make you feel. Uh, so that it can encourage you to go ahead and do that um, when, when you do need a break and, and need to engage in some self-care. I went quite a bit over, I apologize for that. <laughs> it's okay, we've got time for that. All right. Um, we're good. Uh, so I can, uh, first of all, can we have a huge round of applause for Wendy? Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we've got some emojis coming in in the window as well. Um, we really appreciate, uh, th this talk spoke to me so much personally as someone who has had a fantastic, I, I mean that sarcastically, mental health journey throughout the pandemic. <laughs> um, so folks, I'm going to stop recording now. Um, just because this is some very private potential topics um, and we might want to feel safer um, asking questions or comments without the recording on. So, stop and stop.